TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. We are live. But by the, uh, by the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, this is completely unnecessary. We won't need this, but it's here. This is warning screen. Don't forget, if you do want to catch a live, the lit one, the username is at the bottom of the screen. Twitch.com is where you can type it in. And we got Patreon. We post five days a week. And um, the link to that is in the description below. Keep in mind, my birthday is in seven days. That's tough. Salute to everybody who dropped the dono on the Twitch. And a super thanks in the chats of the uh, YouTubes. I'm thanking y'all early. <laughs> uh, this is why British cities keep going bankrupt. This is Tom Nicholas. This is his channel. Let me sub up. Hit that like button, of course. Mm, let's get into it, man. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. My bad. My birthday's in eight days. <laughs> My fault. Eight days. Eight days from now. Today is the 20... Today is the 18th. So there's the math for you. This city just declared bankruptcy. What city? Unless something changes in the UK pretty soon, it's unlikely to be the last. What city are you in? Berlin. The UK soon, it's unlikely to be the last. I'm in Birmingham, the UK's second most popular city. Birmingham? Just declared bankruptcy? Home of the Peaky Blinders, Black Sabbath, Cadbury Chocolate, Aston Villa Football Club, and a genuinely interesting pen museum, Birmingham has long been a trend-setting town. But at the end of last summer, it became a pioneer in a slightly less desirable sense, when the city's council announced that it had gone bust. A British city declaring itself bankrupt like this is usually an exceptionally rare event. Between 1988 what? and 2018, just two English councils ever found themselves in such a terrifying position. Hackney did it too? In the six years since, however, the number of cities falling into financial turmoil has skyrocketed. Northamptonshire, Croydon, not surprised. Nottingham, not surprised. Never heard of the rest of them except Birmingham. I'm really surprised at Birmingham. I did not know this. Six local councils have declared themselves effectively bankrupt since 2021, and it seems unlikely that they'll be the last. A recent survey by the local government association found that nearly one in five council chiefs in England feared their council could similarly run out of cash in the next two years. I've blocked four days out my schedule, booked three travel lodges, and committed to driving an inadvisable distance in order to visit four British cities or counties which have recently gone bust and to try and figure out exactly what's going wrong here. As well as visiting one city which is experimenting with a whole new model of governance, which can hopefully help cities to avoid a similar fate in the future. Oh, uh, he must be talking about the, uh, where everybody gets their own mayor instead of a big umbrella. He must be talking about that. I just learned about that. You know what I'm saying? I'm up on my UK politic things in that nature. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I honestly might move there. I'm, I'm telling you. When y'all see me out there making videos, y'all gonna be like, bro, you live here? Yeah, don't worry about that, though. <laughs> it's quiet. Am I going deaf or is the video quiet? Plymouth. He's in Plymouth. Earlier that day. Okay. It's like a little movie. Morning. To so welcome to the car. This will be our um, be our home for the next uh, four days, uh, three nights. So we have sort of all the the basic features. Um, five wheels, one for steering. You know what's crazy? I had this video saved and ready to watch when it was one hour old. 
and I, I didn't watch it yet. I just wanted to let it, you know what I'm saying, do its thing. Uh, now it's, it's that's enough. So here's the plan. Over the next three days, we're going to be visiting four cities and counties, all of which have gone broke over the last few years. We're driving up to Birmingham, down to Northamptonshire, back up to Nottingham, across to Liverpool, which hasn't gone bankrupt, but I'll explain why later, way back down to Woking, and then, well, back I've got an additional surprise destination for day three, but I'm going to keep that under wraps for now. Why would he do it in such a manner like this? Why would he go to walking first? Whatever. I'm not gonna lie, I am a little bit apprehensive of how much driving I've got to do over the next few days, as well as whether we can try and squeeze in all the filming we want to do in each location with the time that we've got. But trying to tell this story from like behind my desk back at home, didn't feel like it would quite capture the scale of the crisis that British cities are currently facing. So you decided to get your foot to the metal, pedal to the metal and go outside. I salute that type of journalism. Or whatever we would call this. Okay, the sun is up. We've had some breakfast. We are on the M5 and have avoided accidentally getting the bridge to South Wales. And next stop is Birmingham. How long of a drive is that? It looked long on that map. With the council being uh, bankrupt, they're saying that now youth clubs are, you know, not being opened and I think it's just detrimental to the youth. Buses as it's, well. That's, especially in Birmingham, it's going to be detrimental to the youth if, 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 if local, if things that keep the youth occupied are not there anymore, it's going to, oh yeah, crime rate's going to shoot up. Out of pure boredom, it's going to shoot up. You know what I'm saying? Every action has a reaction. So you got to choose. You got to pick and choose where your money is put, like where the rest of the money is going towards. I'm oh, curious. They're heavily pinned on. I think it's just detrimental to the youth. Buses as well, because they're heavily packed. Like the other day, um, I'm fasting. And I left uni about two hours early to get home on time. And I was on the bus for about an hour and a half, when usually it should take... 25 minutes mm, and that was really exhausting. They're talking about the bins going, collections going from one week to two weeks. So it's like, it's the little things that you're starting to notice that it's, it just makes me a bit sad. This structure behind me is the Alexander Stadium, the largest purpose-built athletic stadium anywhere in the UK. Just two years ago, this arena played host to the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games, a kind of off-brand nice. Olympics for ex-members of the British Empire. And Birmingham was a fitting choice for such an event. Not only does it have a rich history as one of the crucibles of Britain's industrial revolution. That's, this is why I like Birmingham because of its history. It's very similar to Chicago's uh, when, as far as like industrial type situations. The steady stream of global like migration like to the city has made it one of Europe's most diverse. In the lead-up to the Commonwealth too, yeah. Games, Birmingham City Council's then leader, Ian Ward, had promised the event would kick off what he described as a golden decade of opportunity for the city, inviting all kinds of new jobs, opportunities and investment. But whatever optimism might have buzzed through the city during those two weeks of pole vault and pentathlon, it's safe to say those grander promises now ring pretty hollow. I'm Julian Pritchard, I'm a Green Party councillor presenting the board of Drury Teeth and Money Hall, which is in the south of Birmingham. Obviously, council is, is often said, said it's the biggest local authority in Europe. Certainly, it covers the biggest population, certainly and definitely in the UK. Council is Labour run, so Labour have a majority on Birmingham City Council, um, so I'm the opposition. I mean, I don't think any of my ward gets a good deal, to be honest, out of the council. We're now potentially even going to lose even more. Um, so we, we have a library um, and we have a youth centre potentially might lose both of those. See, back in September 2020... That's crazy. What's more detrimental for the youth to lose? The library, the opportunity to to ingest now un, un, unbothered amounts of knowledge or, or the youth center? It's both a crazy thing to lose. And I say that to say I've never even been in a library as an adult. 23, Birmingham City Council's Director of Finance uploaded this letter to the city's website. 
This document is what's called a Section 114 notice, and it is, in effect, a financial distress signal. In publishing a Section 114 notice, the city was formally notifying the UK central government in Westminster that its projected income for the coming year in taxes and other revenue was not able to cover the cost of its projected outgoings. The consequences of admitting financial defeat in this way are pretty dire. Here in Birmingham, residents are preparing for an unprecedented 21% hike in local property taxes to try and dig the city out of its financial hole. But how did the city get into this financial hole? You know what I'm saying? Like, who mismanaged the city's money? Well, council-run services are being cut to the bone. This ranges from a 100% cut to all arts funding in the city, to a slashing of the support given to children and their families, to dimming street lamps to try and save on electricity. And it's not like council services were being lavishly funded around here to begin with. In fact, one councillor quipped last month that amid brutal cuts to bin collections and youth centres, the next decade was unlikely to be golden for anyone but rats and gangsters. 100%. You're not lying. This is a this is a pretty great statement. I mean, not great statement, but it's a pretty accurate statement. Cuz that's the exact thought that came in my head. This is going to be great. It's going to be great for the gangs. Now, we've got, you know, several million cuts worth to the library budget. Yeah, as I said, potentially all the libraries on to find the sea. There's 36 at the moment and they are going to potentially close up to 25 of those, so there'll be 11 left. It would be a, you know, we would be losing something. You know, the council is, well, you know, we're supposed to be about trying to create neighborhoods and communities and, and investing in areas. And so you take stuff out, then that makes it a lot harder to do. So, how did Birmingham go from such dazzling highs to such bleak lows in such a short period of yeah, time? That's a good question. And why is financial turmoil here? caused anxieties in council buildings across the country. Okay, assuming I'm able to navigate the incredibly confusing roads, that is goodbye Birmingham. There are a couple of events unique to Birmingham which have caused it to implode in quite such a spectacular fashion. The Section 114 letter which officially announced the city's insolvency placed the blame squarely on a series of equal pay disputes brought against the city council by current and former employees. Over the past 15 years, the city has repeatedly been found to have upheld discriminatory pay practices which caused women to be paid less than men. God, come on, Birmingham. It's 2024. Why are you still how is this still happening? And having already paid out over £1 billion in settlements, it was suggested that the outstanding £760 million the city is still estimated to owe was the key reason for the council going bust. This narrative has since come under question. In March, accountant and academic James Brackley... To put that in perspective, that <laughs> unequal pay, discriminatory pay uh, discrepancies were the reason that Birmingham went into bankruptcy. Wrote a piece for The Conversation based on an extensive review he'd undertaken of Birmingham City Council's finances. Brackley found that the real reason for Birmingham's immediate financial turmoil was the fumbled implementation of a new accounting and HR system by the American company Oracle. Not only did migrating to the new- Hold on. Why does it come back to America? What we got to- Oh my days. I remember Oracle though. They handled some of- when I last worked, they handled some of our stuff too. The new Oracle software system ended up costing more than three times what was initially quoted, but the software itself was highly dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah. So, no, they, they okay, so we were going to switch over to Oracle, and we ended up not doing it. They're still with the, like, I talked to people that still work there. They're still with the same um, system as when I was there. This was, like, five years ago. They never did it. So, we they wherever I worked, dodged that bullet. The, all, the whole of Birmingham did not, though, this time. At points, council staff basically had no idea how much money was going out and coming in. With these events in mind, it's tempting to view Birmingham's financial collapse as solely the result of mismanagement on the part of council leadership. Michael Gove, the member of the UK central government in charge of overseeing local councils, did just that. 
blaming Birmingham's bankruptcy on, quote, poor leadership, weak governance, and woeful mismanagement of employee relations. Nevertheless, whilst bad decision-making was clearly a factor in pushing Birmingham over the edge, the idea that the city's insolvency is only a product of compensation claims and bad computer systems begins correct. to crumble the moment that we place Birmingham's troubles into wider context. Okay. Because, as I mentioned at the top of this video, Birmingham is not the first city here in the UK. Appreciate the follow G4 for MRG Gamer, Mr. Gamer one. Northampton Shire. We already going here. So <laughs> it's worth me acknowledging that the place we're currently in, Northamptonshire, is not a city. In fact, it is very much a rural county. But the ways these things are governed in the UK is remarkably similar. I'll explain a bit more about it later, but just go with it now, please. It was from here in Northamptonshire that we got the first sign that things might not be entirely rosy in the world of British local government. In 2018, the County Council here became the third English council ever to issue a Section 114 notice, announcing itself effectively bankrupt. The fact that 18 years had passed since Hackney had been the most recent place to do so meant that it was easy to view this as a pretty exceptional event. The government commission tasked with investigating Northamptonshire. Yeah, I'm interested how North. This is a rural area. How did that happen? The council's failure cracked out all their Microsoft Office skills to blame its insolvency on hubris on the part of local politicians and council staff. Since then, however, the catastrophes have kept piling up. Croydon, Slough, Thurrock, Woking, Birmingham, and most recently Nottingham have all announced they've run out of cash in the past two years. And even in cities which remain in the black for now, leaders are warning that their situation is so dire. My fault. In the black for now, leaders are warning that their situation is so dire we might soon be facing, quote, the end of local government in the UK. While there might be unique circumstances involved in all of these cases, then there's clearly something much larger going on here. But to understand that, we first need to take a little look at how local government here in the UK works. But that's a job for tomorrow because I am absolutely <laughs> knackered. Oh. Wait, couldn't, couldn't this be a, like an aftermath of exiting the EU as well? You know what I'm saying? Or no. This is Nottingham the next day. We always vote, yeah. Yeah. Women yeah. died to get. See, y'all, see? This is the difference between me and other reactors. First of all, other reactors are not watching this. That's first and foremost. And and be cut like listen, hear me out, hear me out. They don't retain information like I do. Y'all be thinking I don't be paying attention, but look right now as I recite everything that I've ever learned about politics in the UK and what's going on on the day to day basis. See, I don't just one ear out the other. In my reactions. I listen. I retain. I, I gather information, and it's stored. And when I be trying to tell y'all I'm a genius, I'm a genius in my own right. You get me? That is the vote. Oh, yeah. We always vote. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the vote's very important. Yeah. Uh, people are given a lot of time and effort and some of their lives, I suppose, over the years to guarantee what we can do today. I've never voted. No? No. In, in they all think of themselves. Hold yeah. on, wait. We got run out of cash. They don't think of us. Well, probably the one I vote for, not go in. Mm -hmm. But it certainly not be the main parties, mm -hmm. because I don't rate them. 
For the local election, we always go for the same people because they're so good to our area. They're so supportive. You can email them, they'll try and do something for you. Clearly so not. we didn't actually plan to film this video um, like mere weeks out from a local election uh, here in the UK. Uh, this video has been on the cards for ages. We just happens to make it now. But we've been in Nottingham City Centre this morning chatting to people about whether they're planning on voting, um, how enthusiastic they are about that, what kind of issues really matter to them. And it's been a really uh, interesting few hours. We've heard like a real range of opinions about people who um, aren't planning on voting at all, about people who uh, believe it is a kind of fundamental civic duty that they should, um, people who are really angry at the council, people who absolutely have got these really heartwarming stories of councillors um, helping them out, which has been really lovely too. But in order to get on with the next- As a, as a, as a, this is my whole thing, man. As a as a tax paying citizen anywhere, that that is a that is a situation, you can't go into this with a heart. Oh, but they do. Oh, but they no. I'm going in here as a strategic businessman. If you're not gonna benefit me personally, I don't know. It's a no. It's a no, and I don't care about your family. I don't care about nothing else. I don't care about what you've done. You know what I'm saying? Are you going to benefit me personally? At the end of the day, are you going to benefit me personally and do and what is what you do aligning with what I think? <laughs> this is very simple. This part of the video, I first need to come good on my promise to explain exactly how local government here in the UK works. I'm in Nottingham, just to the north of where we finished off yesterday's journey. Of all the cities we're visiting on this little road trip, Nottingham was the most recent to declare itself effectively bankrupt. And it's also the one which begins to point to the larger issues at play here. Unlike Birmingham or Northamptonshire, Nottingham hasn't befallen any great financial calamity. There are no error-prone computers or council hubris here. And yet, the city has still managed to go bust. Like most countries, the UK has multiple tiers of government, with different entities having different powers and responsibilities depending on where they sit in the hierarchy. If that sounds fairly orderly, it's not. In fact, the whole system is so wildly inconsistent to the point that, depending on where one lives in the UK, one might be blessed with as few as two layers of government to deal with, or as many as four. Where I live, down in Plymouth, political governance is divided up between just two bodies. Matters of national importance are decided upon by the central government in London, whilst local matters are overseen by Plymouth City Council. Nice and simple. If, however, you're lucky enough to live in the picturesque village of Denmead in southeast England, various decisions affecting your life will be broken up between the Denmead Parish Council, the Winchester City Council, the Hampshire County Council, and only then the UK Parliament. You get to- That seems like a headache living there. To vote for representatives trying to get anything done of all of those bodies and if you have any issues you have the additional fun of trying to work out which of those four representatives has the power to do anything about it to make matters even more confusing some areas of england such as nottingham here have recently become part of what are called combined authorities this involves neighboring city or borough or county councils working together to coordinate transport and economic development plans often under the auspices of a regional mayor. In London, this has actually taken a step further in the form of the Greater London Authority. Led by the London Mayor, the GLA has strategic responsibility for life across London's 32 boroughs, despite each of those boroughs having considerable day-to-day -day autonomy in their own right. Meanwhile, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own national parliaments, which in those countries form a separate layer of government between local government and central government in London. And this is before we even begin to talk about the nine administrative English regions, which are used for some statistical purposes or local. Oh my God. I used to think when I was in high school that we had, <laughs> we had it bad when it came to figuring out who could do what and, and what, how politics words, the house of this, the house of that. This this is a headache. I would never pass this class. Whatever class this is located in, in school out there, I wouldn't pass it. Police and crime commissioners. 
All that being said, most people in the UK will have either one or two local councils which serve as their primary forms of local government. Is that the tea bell? I mean, it's in in incredibly cool. Those councils might be called city councils or district councils or borough councils or county councils, depending on their size and how rural or urban they are. But whether or not they have a strategic body such as a combined authority above them or a voluntary parish or town council which sits beneath, will usually be one or two bodies which have the largest impact on their lives. But what exactly is it that a local council does? The role of city, borough, district or county councils here in the UK then is very similar to that of city governments in other countries. The central government in Westminster retains the power to issue currency, set trade policy and start and end wars, while local councils are in charge of operating on the ground services, such as housing, waste management, libraries, parks, street maintenance and <coughs> certain social care and family support services. So I thought you'd bring you to some kind of council amenity for our second bit of filming in Nottingham. Uh, we've come to Nottingham Arboretum, which right. is apparently the inspiration for Neverland in uh, J.M. Barry's Peter Pan. See, in the UK, central government actually has a pretty big say in how local councils run the areas they're responsible for. For one, councils actually don't get a huge amount of choice in what services they provide. If you look down a list of services which tend to be provided by city and county councils in the UK, you'll find that some are what's called discretionary services. This means they're provided entirely at the council's own initiative. That's bullshit. While most councils will run <laughs> glorious public parks. That's like, insane. What do you mean that's your discretion? Like, so whatever day you feel like it. <laughs> All right. While most councils will run glorious public parks like this one, leisure centres and museums to uplift local histories, there's nothing to say that they have to other than the fear that local residents might vote them out if they don't. Other services, however, are what are referred to as statutory services. Well, you have this to. means that the central government in London has passed legislation which requires councils to provide those... They're not required to do a lot. Organise elections... Housing advice, okay, waste collection, all right, street cleaning, taxi licensing, building control. That's six. Oh, okay. Well, it's only so seven that they don't have to do. Car parking, funding for voluntary art organized, public park maintenance, public toilets, leisure centers, local museums. So everything fun is an option. services by law. Local authorities, for example, are legally required to provide free bin collections. They have a legal responsibility to maintain roads and pavements, and they have a duty to provide welfare and safeguarding services for children and vulnerable adults. Councillors might have a reasonable degree of flexibility in exactly how they provide these services, but they can't simply choose not to. In fact, if you drive through a pothole in the UK and it damages your car, you're often entitled to claim compensation from the council responsible for that road for failing to keep it in a good enough state of repair. This requirement to... So that's the same as in Chicago. Or actually, I, was, I, I lived in a suburb called Skokie. I was in a... They do, they do that as well. I filed it and never got it. I'm talking this is 10 years, maybe longer ago. Never received any compensation provide a minimal level of service is probably a good thing. Turnout at local elections in the UK is depressingly low, and so it's probably good to have a defence against some mad libertarian taking over a city and deciding to just let vulnerable kids sleep on the street or something. The problem is, is that all of this stuff costs money. When it comes to raising funds to pay either for these core services or for discretionary services that councillors might want to provide for local residents on top of them, Local governments have even less power. But if we're going to make tonight's travel lodge, we should probably talk about that one on the road to our next destination. This next stop is actually a bit of a detour, but I think it's really important to visit if we're going to tell this whole story properly. I mean, I don't know if I've explained how much I dislike driving yet, but yeah, I'd definitely it's Liverpool be adding going to, right? stop if I didn't feel it was important. So there are four ways in which city, borough and county councils in the UK generate money. 
The first is what in England, Scotland and Wales is called council tax and what in Northern Ireland is called rates. These are both property taxes calculated based on the value of the property in which a resident lives. So it's everybody pays council flat, I mean, like property tax, even if you're renting? Or no? Because if you own a building out here in America, you got to pay property tax. But if you're renting, I'm pretty sure that's calculated into your rent. And they take it out and they do what they... No, it, whatever the rent is, the rent is. They save their money and go pay the, the property tax later, the, the private owner. It's one charge for everyone who lives in a particular property, but there are discounts for people who live alone. Depending on where you live in the country and how fancy your house is, council tax might be as low as £763 a year for a cupboard in the city of London or over £5,000 for a mansion in Rutland. I think a lot of people understandably assume that council... In Chicago, you could pretty much guarantee that it was a, a one rate. <laughs> it was like 10 bands. I don't know, something like that. Tax covers a sizable portion of the cost of running a local government. But this is actually far from the case. If we take the example of Staffordshire County Council, whose jurisdiction we're currently driving through, we find that council tax accounted for just 37% of the body's income wow. in the year 2023 to 2024. A further 10% came from business rates, business which rates. is another property tax, which is similar to council tax, but which well, is charged businesses. to businesses with premises within a council's jurisdiction. Offices, shops, factories, warehouses, bars and cafes can all be liable to pay business rates, which are calculated based on the rental value of a given unit. As with council tax, however, there are again discounts for smaller businesses and for charities. An equally paltry 6.5% came from what's labelled other, other income. income? This that? will include a wide range of income streams from services that the council charges for. Car parking, taxi licences, commercial waste collection, hire of council buildings for weddings and events. All of these services come with a charge Tickets. and therefore generate direct income for the council. Now, the maths heads among you would have noticed that these figures don't come even close to hitting 100%. And that's because a full 46.5% of the council's revenue Government doesn't grants. come from locally raised taxes on residents or businesses, but from grants provided to it from central government. Some of these government grants are pre-assigned and ring-fenced for certain services. More than half of the money that Staffordshire receives from central government, for example, comes in the form of the dedicated schools grant. And this has to be spent on schools. A council can't simply decide to skimp on schooling in order to spend some of that money on something else instead. Other grants from the government will be more flexible, with councils being able to allocate money as it sees fit depending on local priorities. There are some obvious benefits to such a huge chunk of local councils' incomes coming through central government. Spatial inequality runs deep in the UK. The median weekly pay for a full-time employee in London is £796, whereas in North... Wait, for how much? Say it again. Spatial inequality runs deep in the UK. The median weekly pay for a full-time employee in London is £796. That's weekly? What did he say? Weekly? What does that mean? What does that mean? Hey, come on now. Is this, does he mean 796 pounds a week? I need answers before I continue because I need to understand what's happening. Let's press pause. If so, that's, that's 796 for, four, for a 40 hour week, is that what we saying? Whereas in Northeast England, it's just 614. Capturing tax centrally through income tax and the like, and then distributing it outward to local councils, at least theoretically gives central government the power to soften the effects of this imbalance. That's not to say they act on that power as much as they should, but they at least could if they wanted. Nevertheless, the combination of such a large chunk of local councils' funding coming from central government, alongside the fact that that same central government also gets to tell councils what services they should prioritise through that system of statutory services, begins to place a big question mark over how autonomous local councils really are.
all of which would make politicians in London seeking to place the blame for British cities going bankrupt entirely on city governments seem a bit questionable. Slightly. Because rather than an unfortunate accident, this enfeeblement of local councils by the central government is very much by design. And our next stop will be able to show us why. We've gone to the pool. I'm in Liverpool, where yeah. it is incredibly, incredibly windy. Liverpool has long maintained a slightly distinct political identity to much of the rest of England. Never was this clearer than in the 1980s. Throughout the course of that decade, the UK as a whole thrice elected Margaret Thatcher on a platform of cutting taxes and reducing public expenditure. Many in Liverpool, however, remained deeply sceptical. In fact, in 1983, yeah, the city went in the complete here. opposite direction to the rest of the country by voting in a city council led by Militant, a left-wing faction within the Labour Party which couldn't have been more opposed to Thatcher if they tried where Thatcher sought to open up every aspect of national life to the free market, Militant sought to overthrow it entirely. This animosity came to a head a year later, when Thatcher's government introduced legislation which placed a limit on the amount of tax local councils could raise from their residents. This served the Conservatives' agenda in two ways. Not only did it reduce people's taxes, but by limiting the amount of money councils had available to spend, it forced councils to streamline services and thus further reduce the role of the state in people's everyday lives. Militant-led Liverpool had other ideas. Rather than reducing their spending, the City Council unveiled an ambitious programme of activity in which they pledged to build new houses, open new sports centres, and provide a greater number of nursery places for local children. How did that work Crucially, out? the cost of all this required the council to set a budget in which their expenditure exceeded the income they were due to receive through government grants or through newly capped taxes. This was, and is, illegal for a city council to do. Nevertheless, local leaders adopted the slogan that it would... It would be Liverpool to do it, though. It's always Liverpool. It was better to break the law than break the poor by allowing the city... Facts. ...see to drift into decline. Trend centers. The response from the political establishment was swift. The council's hope had been that central government would be forced to plug the financial gap in the council's budget, but Thatcher refused to do so. The Labour Party, who on the national level were under the firmly centrist leadership of Neil Kinnock, enthusiastically denounced the council as foolish idealists and suspended the politicians responsible. If Thatcher had already been keen to curb the power of local government, the Liverpool Rebellion only emboldened her further. Her tenure was one of sweeping reductions to the role and agency of local councils. Alongside caps on local taxes, Thatcher also reduced councils' powers over schools and forced them to sell off huge quantities of social housing. Dang. This war on local government was partly an economic <coughs> crusade, but as the standoff with Millicent Liverpool highlights, there were political motivations at play too. She was not with the, uh, she basically said, if you broke, deal with it. Fix it yourself. No more funding. No in more an ideal breaks. World, the relationship between local government and national government would be one of mutual cooperation. But local politicians ever since have tended to view local councils as inherent obstacles to change. After all, it's no fun sweeping to power with some great vision for how you're going to change the country, only to have that vision frustrated by a bunch of disagreeable councillors in Liverpool or Surrey or anywhere else. When the Conservatives were ousted in the late 1990s, it's telling that the incoming Labour government under Tony Blair didn't proceed to roll back Thatcher's reforms. While they did increase local government funding, this came with strings attached in the form of targets and so-called performance indicators, which councils had to meet to appease Westminster. The lesson learned from Thatcher's tenure was clear, that local government needed to be constrained and controlled. But more on that when we reach our final destination tomorrow morning. Northwest England. Have a lot of foliage going on. 
Okay, this is our travel lodge for night two. Um, the third one is actually for the, 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 the end of the third day. Um, and I thought I'd let you into this one because this one comes with its very own podcasting studio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you, like, I really, this is weird. Why is there not a couch in here? You've done interviews in here. Like, uh, so what's your thoughts on um, uh, local councils struggling for cash? Oh, well, um, I, think, I think this and that and that, and actually I think it's uh, like this. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, like, I really think um, Travelodge could rebuild itself as a kind of studio of some description. OK, it's actually not raining. You could very easily do a podcast right there. He's on to something. Which is something. Oh, no, it is. OK, every time I put my head up, it starts. Yeah, he yummy. It stops raining every time I take it down again. Right. Let's get going. Oh, the parcel shelf's got stuck. So, with my ability to see out my rearview mirror restored, we headed back down across the breadth of England to our final destination, Woking. We Whoa. are getting far closer to London than I usually like to be. But it kind of feels like it's correct towards the end of the video to kind of be approaching the corridors of power. Of course they did. Why would they why would they accept that? Anything that could potentially paint them in a bad light, it's not happening. Woking. In February 2009, okay. future Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, wrote an opinion piece for The Guardian. Which in itself seems kind of ludicrous now, this callback to an era when conservatives at least occasionally had to pretend to be liberal technocrats. In the article, Cameron promised that if he were elected, his government would lead a programme of, quote, radical decentralisation to reach every corner of the country. He claimed to have acknowledged the extent to which previous governments have reduced the powers of local councils and to be promising a dramatic reversal of that trend. On the surface, Cameron's government did appear to come good on this promise. Reduce the powers of local councils and to be promising a dramatic reversal of that trend. On the surface, Cameron's government did appear to come good on this promise. And I was muted, wasn't I? I said this is probably one of the most cringest handshakes I ever Thing seen. What? I got, I gotta get it off. You know what I'm saying? Local councils and to be promising. Who shakes with a left hand? Who leads with the left? Isn't shaking left-handedly disrespectful? Like that's what it's looked at. It. A dramatic reversal of that trend. Cringe. On the surface, Cameron's government did appear to come good on this promise. To name just one example, he pushed for a further rolling out of so-called Metro Mayors to provide strong, identifiable leaders for regions and cities outside London. And this initiative has had more than a little success. In Manchester, Labour Mayor Andy Burnham has been able to bring local buses back under city control, to improve support for people sleeping rough, and to develop plans to introduce a new city-accredited education pathway for local young people who want to enter technical careers. While mayors, devolution deals, and other less shiny reforms devolution, might theoretically see? increase the autonomy of local government, however, the matter of money remains. And in this, the succession of conservative prime ministers, which have held power since 2010, have been far less generous. In fact, according to the Institute for Government, core funding for local councils was cut by 40% between 2009 and 2020. Whatever powers local councils might theoretically have gained then, they've been left with little cash to actually do much with these new abilities. Mm. The whole system of- mm, so it's trickery. So they still a puppet. Hey, we gotta give you the money, but you ain't got none. You, you ain't getting none. So you can take these new powers, but what you gonna do? What you gonna fund it with? 
Statutory and discretionary services has begun to look ridiculous as councillors have been forced to cut anything which isn't legally mandated to the bone. Budgets for park maintenance, for example, have been slashed by a third. Funding for local arts organisations has dropped by 40%. 60% of public loos across the country have been closed and nearly 400 swimming pools in England have been shut down. Even where councils do legally have to provide a service, they've often had to reduce that provision to the bare minimum. Providing a library service might be a legal requirement, but the law is pretty vague about what that service needs to look like. As such, hundreds upon hundreds of libraries have been closed over the past decade and others have been reduced to minimal opening times. Similarly, council youth centres which used to cater to a wide range of young people now have to focus their efforts on children who are already in need of intervention. Things were really brought to a head, however, by Covid. Where council budgets were already stretched, the pandemic introduced all kinds of new responsibilities which sent their outgoing soaring at the same time as income through taxes and revenue-generating services like car parks took a nosedive. While the government did occasionally but provide some outside. additional funding to councils during this period, it was rarely enough to cover the shortfall. And after 10 years of austerity, there simply isn't much left to cut. In January, the BBC reported that UK councils were shouldering a collective debt of £97.8 billion. At the time of recording, however, central government has refused to provide any additional financial support. Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt has instead suggested that councils should cut back on diversity and inclusion schemes. Which, given Birmingham's bankruptcy was at least partly the result of the council there upholding widespread pay discrimination, is maybe a little inadvisable. Elsewhere, ministers have allowed councils to sell off assets such as land, community centres, leisure centres and town halls to try and cover the shortfall in their day-to-day -day spending. Which really exposes the heart of what's going on here. For the past decade, conservative politicians have talked endlessly about the decentralization of power. First it was localism, then devolution deals, then leveling up. By ruthlessly starving councils of cash, however, Cameron, May, Johnson, Truss and Sunak have essentially forced councils of all political stripes to follow a ruthless agenda of cost-cutting, privatizations and sell-offs. And the more local assets that are sold off, the more services that are transferred into private hands, the worse things are likely to get. But despite how grim things are, and they are pretty grim, I didn't want to leave this video on an entirely depressing note. Honestly, that seems like, like on, on some fin for yourself, we're gonna starve you out type situation. And then since y'all want all this power for local, local, all right, cool. Cool, <laughs> cool, eat, 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 reap what you sow. Just remember, stand on it then. It was basically what they said, stand on that. So we're gonna round off our trip with something of a bonus while we, 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 like we Stand on it while we take your feet from under you. Which is trying to do things a little bit differently in a way which doesn't completely ameliorate the effects of economic downturns or government funding cuts but does at least seek to bring wealth, and most importantly, power, back to local communities. Welcome to Preston. Preston is a relatively small city of around 150,000 people Preston. in Northwest England. And I will admit we've cheated a bit here. We're actually filming this on the morning of day three before we go to Woking. But it felt like a horrific waste of carbon to drive all the way down to Woking, only to drive all the way back up to Preston, and then to drive all the way back down to the glorious Southwest to go home. But nevertheless, welcome to Preston. <laughs> to understand what Preston's been doing differently over the past few years and why, it's helpful first to understand some of the knock-on effects which the various privatizations and sell-offs which the central government has been encouraging councils to perform have on a place. Imagine you run a council, and that council employs a big team of waste collection staff. Folks who get up early in the morning to drive big lorries around town and collect everyone's bins. If you directly employ that team, then a large chunk of the money that you pay them in wages will get spent locally in your town. On buying food and going to the cinema and doing escape rooms and whatever else it is that your fictional waste collection team are doing in their spare time. 
But now imagine that you privatize that service, by which I mean handing it over to a private company to run for profit. A few things happen. The first is that the company will likely look to quote unquote streamline the service being provided to cut costs, as the now privatized Royal Mail has been petitioning to do by abandoning Saturday post deliveries. The second is that they'll likely look to employ a new waste collection team on supposedly quote unquote more competitive terms, i.e., for less pay Cheaper. or at the very least less secure contracts. The third is that all that money that they <coughs> save through this cost cutting becomes profit, which first gets deposited into the bank account of the company which now provides that service and then gets distributed to that company's shareholders. Particularly where contracts are handed to a big company like Biffa or Virador, both of which are owned by American investment firms, what happens is that some of that money which was previously America controls your garbage. being paid to local employees who would then spend at least some of it in local shops and bars and bowling alleys is now leaving the area entirely. Since 2013, however, the City Council here in Preston have been experimenting with a new approach to city governance, which has come to be known as the Preston Model, or more broadly, as community wealth building. My name is Martin Rawlings and I'm the Deputy Leader of the Council. I'm also in charge of the finances. It's a really tough landscape, local government right now, and has been for a number of years, and it's not really getting any easier. Uh, the finances are very tight, 50% cuts. We, we've got half the staff that we used to have, half the money. We called it a furnace agenda at the beginning. It got labelled the Preston model by the former Cheryl Chancellor, John McDonnell, some years ago, and that stuck. We looked at what we were spending uh, and whether we were spending it in Preston or nearby. And we also got all the local anchor institutions which are public bodies which are never going to leave Preston you know the hospital the university the police the colleges housing associations we got them involved we got them to look at where they were spending their money and it turns out they weren't spending very much in Preston or, or nearby so we, we developed a program whereby we encouraged uh, this and we doubled our spending in the local economy between 2013 and 15 uh, and we looked at all the anchor institutions and they'd increased their spending and we tried Ooh, keep the money in house that's the best for that is a good way to do it keep all the money in house buddy you doing this you doing that all right we'll do it through us that way the money recirculates through us Smart. An extra 70 million pounds in the Preston economy. Lots of these bodies are spending more money in Preston and the locality. It, the money circulates that little bit longer in the locality. The fact that it's in local people's pockets for longer, the money, means they decide where it goes next. That's what democratising wealth means. Um, whereas if it, if it very quickly filters upwards to shareholders and, and wealthy people, then that choice is gone, we, we have no choice in when, when or if that money ever comes back. Alongside that, we've started to use our assets for public good. So we're building a, a huge cinema complex, which um, you know the private sector will not come in and do it in the city centre. So we're, we're doing it on our land. We keep the land. Um, when it's all paid for, it will be our building publicly owned public wealth that will still be ours mm. and we'll have an asset worth x amount that will belong to the people of preston and not the shareholders who you know that would normally have been the model every penny we spend every asset we've got all the work we do directly benefits preston and then we're not benefit some shareholder thousands of miles away None of this is a silver bullet to the problem of reduced funding from central Can you government. imagine somewhere but bigger than that? wealth building here in Preston is seeing the council trying to leverage what definitely be a fallout somewhere. What power and resources it does have to improve the quality of jobs and services in the city. Where many other British cities and counties have been pushed by 14 years of Tory rule into a vicious cycle of cuts and layoffs and sell-offs and civic decline. Preston perhaps points to what could be possible if local governments were given the power and resources they perhaps need. 
So making this video has felt like a real step up. Not only have we added fox pops and interviews to our repertoire, but spending four days on the road has been a pretty big undertaking. This oh, so this is his first time doing this type type situation? It hasn't only been the most logistically complex of any of the videos that we've made, but almost certainly the most expensive too. I hope all the added But it was very, very enlightening and it was well done though. Like me coming out of here, me watching from America, like I got it. <laughs> I got the point because you did it this way. If you would have just put a bunch of pictures on a computer screen, I wouldn't have. You know what I mean? and energy and I would have did my best. The resource that we put into it has come across in the final product. If you want to find out a little bit more about how this actual road trip portion of the process, I don't. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Good stuff.